All right, what's up? Yo, 101. 101, baby. This is Jump Street 101 right now. Yeah, when the triple digits now, it's triple digits moving forward. That's it. It's a whole new whole new ball game right now. We got all new haircuts. As you yeah. can see. So take it easy. Yeah. Everyone calm down. We got new haircuts. We're looking fresh to death right now, but I think you could handle it. For sure. Um <laughs> Yeah. I got My haircut is I, I just came from Brandon uh Brandon Smith's wedding. That's why I got the haircut. Shout out Brandon Smith, Leah Martinez. It was a lovely event, lovely wedding. Um so big shout out. That was dope. That was like a sick whole reunion. I saw all the pictures and everything. Everyone was there. Yeah. That was awesome. Why'd you get a haircut? Did you have a special event? Or you just <laughs> why, trying to stay why fresh? I get a haircut. Uh, my, <laughs> hair, my hair grows. It gets long once in a while. Okay. So sometimes okay. I like to cut it because it feels better. And it's hot as hell outside. So the less mm, hair, the better nice. for now. That's nice. my excuse. No wedding, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. That's, that's a good reason. <laughs> but everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, Episode 101 with Michael Palak, very special guest. He was in the first he was in the first video I ever saw in 1995, Hoax 2. One of the most epic videos, one of the most consequential videos that was turning point in skating. It was really a big shift in skating at that time. And it was my first video, so I am super stoked to have this guest on. Um, this may be the first episode for you. You may, may have seen other Jump Street episodes, but if this is your first one, please, you know my spiel. If you uh, could go to our social media pages and give us a follow, give us a like on Facebook, give us a follow on Instagram, go to our YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, leave a comment, share it. All these interactions really help. Uh, if you like what you hear, go to iTunes, give us a five-star review, a five-star rating, a review. And we also have a Patreon. It's $3 a month, and we offer exclusive content with... Um, trick tips, we call them inside outs. We have three pieces, it's three tricks exclusively. We put them on there. We do uh, section rewinds with our the guests that we have and we go through old sections and the commentary on that. We just did one with Chris Haffey uh, over over uh, episode 100. That's really good. So if you haven't seen one. that, check that out. Yeah, it was really fun uh, with Chris. Wow, three hours of talking. Yeah, um, plus all yeah, that. So if, yeah. <laughs> like a half hour yeah, of watching his sections with him. Yeah, it was super dope. So, yep, that's my spiel. Um, Please do all that. And if you're watching this now live, hit the like button. And if you're watching it not live, you know, hit the like button. <laughs> hit it anyway. Um, I want to thank. Like uh, I want to thank our new Patreon supporters since our last episode. Uh, we have a bunch in here. Uh, this person goes by the name of Just Ryan. That's it. Thank you, Ryan. Corey H's son. I hope I said that right. Diggy Smalls, Adam Hill, Joseph Morrison, Ace Kiefer, Matthew Bigelow. Declan Bullen, Zach Loans, Guy Lyon, Ethan Ramos, Renee Dillon, Edward Lewis, Kyle Guzman, and Joe Grant. Thank you all so much to all of our new Patreon supporters. If anyone's interested in joining our Patreon, uh, there's a link in the description of this YouTube video, so you can go check it out. Um, we have some cool stuff today. Let's get uh, We have a WTF this week, a big WTF from Sasha Sims. So everyone check it out. Woo! That's like I a, love that half like a half a full pipe. I don't know, backflip to land in the other quarter pipe. That thing is awesome. It is super sketchy too because he doesn't even land in like an actual quarter pipe. It's just like a fucking little wedge. Steep bank. Yeah, yeah. that's super cool. Big shout out wow. Sasha Sims. That was awesome. He has been absolutely killing it lately. I love watching him skate. So yeah, good. he's always been uh, he's always been killing it. And not only that, he went down the snake run at uh, Kona on a little a penny board. Did he? Yeah, which Whoa. was super gnarly. That is gnarly. Yeah. Going down on skates is gnarly, <laughs> let alone on a penny board. Yeah, board. no, it's crazy. Yeah, it's Ooh. crazy. He was killing it at Pow Wow, too. That was awesome to watch. He's just been ripping lately. So, yeah, huge shout out, Sasha Sims. Hell yeah. Uh, I also want to uh, talk about a, a special event happening this week in New York. So if you're in New York or in the New York or tri-state area, we're having a memorial session for our good, ben, uh, good buddy E-Money, Eric Estrada, who we unfortunately lost last year. So we're having a memorial session and a skate contest and barbecue. It's at the Hamilton Bridge Skate Park on 181st Street in New York. Um, it's this Saturday, if you're watching live or sometime in the next day or two, uh, this Saturday, July 3rd at noon. Uh, if you're interested in enter entering the contest, it's a $20 entry fee and there's a $1,000 cash prize for the winner. So everyone come check it out. Uh, it's going to be a nice big turnout and show some love for our buddy E-Money. Rest in peace. We miss you, buddy. 
Yeah, on that on that same note, um, I just wanted to update some of the people in our community. I'm not sure if they know or not, but um, on episode 100, we gave an update about Julian Isaac. He was missing. Um, they have found him, and uh, sadly, he has passed. And uh, the community down there in Texas are doing so much to help their family. So if you wanted to do that, we're gonna we don't have it in now, but we're gonna post the link in the description for if, if you wanted to help the family and. Uh, but yeah, it's an incredibly sad moment for them. So we just want to send our our thoughts and our prayers with them for sure. So yeah, shout out to that William Isaac and everyone down in Texas who helped with that. Hell yeah, sending our, our, our love to the family and and Texas crew over there. I know uh, uh, Jan Welsh did a like a fundraiser thing. We shared that on the Jump Street page and stuff like that. So wherever you can, please donate. Um, it means a lot to them and their family in this unfortunate mm -hmm. time. Uh, we do you want to do about the sponsor? Yes, we also have a, a loyal and a true sponsor. They've been with us since the double digits. Now they're <laughs> with us into the, the triple digits. Uh, it's Blank by Rollerblade. So check out this ad from Blank by Rollerblade. Wow. There you go. Wow. Cameron Talbot. That was really killing good. Killing it. Throwing it down for Blank killing by Rollerblade. It. Thank you, Blank, for sponsoring this episode. Everyone give them a follow on Instagram for now. They got a bunch of stuff coming out in 2021 later in the year. But stay up to date. Give them a follow on Instagram. There's a link in the description on this YouTube video. Blank Rolling Products on Instagram. Uh, we do have a very special thing to announce. Our 100th episode giveaway. We have a winner. So... Anybody who watched this last episode knows that we celebrate our 100th episode, hitting a huge milestone by giving away a $500 gift card to Intuition Skate Shop. That way you can get anything you like, you know, skates, wheels, frames, whatever it is, product, clothing. Um, it's not sponsored by Intuition. We just did that out of our own hearts to support Intuition Skate Shop. Uh, Matt Mickey has done a lot for skating in the past couple decades, so we're buying ourselves a $500 gift card to give to the winner of this giveaway. And all you had to do to enter was pretty much put a comment in episode 100 saying what your favorite episode was. And we're going to pick a winner in a second, but uh, we just want to talk about a couple of special uh, comments in the meantime. Uh, nowhere. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was fun. It was fun to read through the comments, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. like um, I, I, I was saying to someone, I forgot who I was talking to about it, but like, you know, when like there's a clip posted of you uh, on like Instagram and like, you know, Sometimes when you go through the comments, it's like you feel a little guilty because it's like self-indulgent. You know, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, like, you know, yeah, yeah. but like going through these comments was like actually really sick because everyone was just like talking about what episode they liked and who they were able to relate to. And I don't know. I just I just found that to be like a really uh, cool experience to like go through the, the comments. So I don't know. Maybe someone else would have fun doing that, too. It was cool to see all that. Like such a cool community. You're, I feel like such a hippie right now. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right because the people mentioned yeah. like a lot of their favorite moments too, and it was a lot of cool things that I feel like yeah. were important to know and means a lot to either the skater themselves or something that impacted the skate world in general. So it was really cool to see that people were you know soaking this stuff in and, and learning a thing or two because this is why we do this in the first place, you know. So um, before we get to our winner, like I said, just a couple of highlighted comments that we saw um nowhere fast says the murder podcast was my favorite he had me cracking up dude destroy skate spots but avoids contests kind of hearing how blading gave him a path to a career was sick happy to know he's alive and thriving that's awesome thank you it's cool that um it's a good one yeah people are up to date on like huge pros back in the day like mike murder johnson and uh mm -hmm. yeah that's uh it's cool to you know know mike's doing well uh we yeah. have another comment from jason calva Oh, Jason Calva, PhD, my bad. Sorry, Dr. Jason Calva. I should have said that correct in the first place. <laughs> my favorite episodes were both this interview, talking about the happy one, and Farmer. Uh, when Farmer talked about coming home to a note on his fridge that his mom wrote about missing a call from Shane Coburn and getting on Mind Game. Similar when Happy was on Mind Game and had no idea that Aaron Feinberg was on the team until he was sitting at the premiere. This is hilarious. That was, that was pretty cool, too, a pretty cool moment. Yeah, that is cool. 
Uh, one more before we get to our winner from Doug Wartman, who says, uh, one of my favorite episodes was the one with the Kelsos where you guys went in depth into the truth. I thought that was a really interesting use of an episode and it would be cool to see other episodes like that with other videographers and skaters about specific videos. Keep it up. Thanks for making an amazing podcast. Thanks, Doug. That is a good idea. We should do more of those. Maybe for like a Patreon or something. Yeah, that's cool. Special ones. Thanks. Just thanks to everyone who commented. But everyone wants to see who that winner is. So Ooh. should we find out who the winner is? Let, you know what? Now that you mention it, let's find out who the winner is. Uh, okay. Uh, we have over 600 comments from everybody. So it's over 600 entries. And let me scroll on to this thing and pick a winner right now. So the winner of our 100th episode giveaway is Chris Medina who said my favorite episode is the Roadhouse episode because it was my first one and he was, well, first one and he was and still is one of my favorite skaters. Cheers, Chris. Congratulations on winning a $500 gift card to Intuition Skate Shop. Uh, we'll reach out to you after the show's done and get you your prize. Sick. Nice. Hell Congrats, yeah. Chris. I should have had some confetti or something. I, I, we messed this up. <laughs> 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 Hey, that's pretty good, <laughs> right? That's awesome. All right, it looks like the people watching live, they want coach, so. They want coach. All they right. want coach. They want coach, we'll give them coach. <laughs> Bring me in, coach. <laughs> Everyone, please welcome our very special guest for this evening, Mr. Mike Opalik. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. What's up? What's going All on? All right, Mike. I have another special guest with me. Right on cue. Ah, uh, that happened sooner Whoa. than I thought. <laughs> welcome to the show. What's your name? Olive. Olive, Can welcome to the show. Friends? Can you yeah. show us kind of scary? Oh, it's <laughs> scary. Do you want to watch another one? Do you need my help? Okay, I'll be right there. <laughs> okay. Well, well, we'll filibuster until you you get back. You have important give me, family duties. Give me one minute, and I'll go put. It down. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's cool. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Austin, if if this is like uh, you know typical of of this, you know, you get to this age group of the OG skaters generation. You know, that you know they their dads, you know, husbands, their moms, their. Everyone, everyone's they got all busy. these responsibilities. Exactly. This is real life. This is Jump Street 101. This is real life, everybody. We are here live right life. now for you. There's no, there's no fluff in this game, you know? There's no fluff, and we don't deliver the fluff. So this is real life. Uh, Mike has stuff to attend to, but I can't wait to can get we talk about how there's? Can we talk about how there's no fluff in his background real quick? <laughs> yeah. Should I just get a shot of the background coming in? <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> this is, this think, is real. This is as real as it gets, baby. We got the we got the caulk on the end. We got the paint. I don't even know that paint's not going to get used for a while in that process. But we, we he's got, got a the, nice little kitchen chair. The ooze dripping it's, down. It's yeah, that, that kitchen chair. He might have made that. Might not have. Who knows? That's what fatherhood looks like, right there. <laughs> Everybody. That's what it is. Everyone who hasn't had a kid yet, that's what your future looks like. Dude, that's, that's it. That's, that's like awesome. literally, that that <laughs> podcast is over. The, that, that's sixty seconds right there, like from the kid being there and then him going in the background. That's that's fatherhood, and that's it. He's, he 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 ends it perfect, as it. Well. just like that. I put on Disney Plus. Nice. I did it. Father nice. of the year. All right, well, we got to get straight into this now because who knows how long we have yeah. before. So, Mike, first of all, I just want to say it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Um, you were in the first video I ever watched uh, coming up in skating, Hoax 2. I watched it and I started skating January 96. So that was like the first thing I saw coming out of that. And uh, that was like a huge turning point for skating. But we have so much to get into with your story. And you, your story starts very early on in the beginning. So um, I was just wondering if you could give uh, a little bit of an introduction of yourself and how you got into skating and how your story kind of started uh, from the early days. Sure. Well, um I grew up in northeastern Ohio, uh, in a little town called Chesterland. No one's heard of it. And I grew up playing sports my whole life, uh, soccer, baseball, football, wrestling, all that fun stuff. And when I was in high school, I still played soccer and baseball. And uh, my childhood best friend, Steve Perino, got a pair of rollerblades our senior year. Um, this is 1991. 
and he got him for his birthday, which is in March. And they were fun. We used to go mountain biking all the time and we'd go to this skate shop in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, and they had rollerblades with metal frames on them. And we'd go and like borrow them and, and ride around the parking lot for a minute. And he was like, oh, we need to get some of these. So he ends up getting some. And then my birthday in graduation or in beginning of June, kind of the same time. So for, I forget, it was either my birthday or graduation from high school, my parents got me a pair of rollerblades. So the Zetra 303s, the orange ones with the orange laces. And kind of just cruised around that summer on them. And then Steve and I were going to college together at Wright State University down in Dayton, Ohio. And first day we get there, we just start skating around campus and it's not a big campus. It's, it's more of a community college or it was back then. Um, but we're just cruising around where you see these two other dudes on rollerblades and we're like, Oh, we should go meet them. And we meet these two guys, um, Scott and Aaron, and I'm still friends with them to this day. And we just start skating every day. And Aaron got hooked up with this skate shop. Um, in Dayton, there's a big skateboard shop called Ohio Surf and Skate. Mm. Hmm. And we would, we just started skating with them doing like launch ramp demos, like just like a, a launch ramp to flat ground. Or S Steve had this Honda Accord that we'd jump over and land on flat ground. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really great, great stuff. And we were doing all that. And my college career was very short lived. Uh, it didn't last long, but I stayed in Dayton. I was, um, I ended up getting kicked out of college because my grades were so bad. My parents wanted me to stay in school and they wanted me to stay at home in Cleveland. I was like, I don't want to live at home anymore. And so they gave me an ultimatum at the time. I was trying to grow my hair out, <laughs> uh, just doing that rebellious thing I couldn't do as, as a teenager. Um, so they gave me this ultimatum. They're like, stay at home. We'll pay for your community college or you can go back to Dayton. You have to go to school, pay for it and cut your hair. It's like, let's go get a haircut. So a lot of haircuts did that. this episode. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Open mine looks as good as your guys'. So uh, I go back down to Dayton and enroll in a community college to whatever courses. I don't remember. And I get this call from the owner, Jerry George of Ohio Surf and Skate. And he's like, hey, Mike, there's an audition down in Cincinnati. And that's how he talks. <laughs> uh, for those who know, Jerry George. <laughs> uh, so for Airborne. And go down to the audition. And, you know, at that time, there was Inline Skater was the only magazine out. And Rollerblade was the only, uh, only one with a team. I, uh, I guess there's no other really manufacturers that big. So I knew of Chris Edwards um, and some other people. I think there may have even been one MTV Sports they've already done. I don't remember. That might be too early. But there wasn't much out there. So anyway, I go to this audition to see some people I've seen in the magazines. They're all sponsored by Rollerblade. Justy was there. Uh, Pat Parnell was there. Chris Mitchell was there. And all they wanted us to do is go over this launch box. I was like, okay. So I do it. And they're like, can you do that again? I was like, sure. It's super easy. Uh, I get a call back from that audition. Like, can you come to another one? Okay. So now it's a, a launch ramp going down a hill. So, and they're like, all, you, all we want to do is go off it. Don't do any grabs. Don't do any spins. Don't do anything. So do that a couple times. A couple weeks later, I get a call, like, they put me in. So, I, so me and a buddy, um, we got a part as stunt skaters in Airborne. And that's where I basically met all Rollerblade guys and kind of got me out to California later that year. That was 93. So that was kind of a long story short, I guess, of my introduction to skating. Oof. I like how everybody's one well, like first skates was the Zetra, the Zetra threes back then. That's like the only yeah. skate, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there was a teal one. I don't, I don't know if there's a yellow one and a teal one. I don't know if they're the same numbers or if the colors were a different model of skate at the time. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. 
I, I love how um, your story kind of goes for full circle because you said you ran into the other two guys on campus skating. You're like, yeah, this is awesome. Let's skate together. And that's like pretty much how it yeah. is now <laughs> still. Oh, yeah. It was so awesome. To, to, and like we would literally, so Wright State University is a, um, they built the, the school, I don't remember when, but they put tunnels under it for handicapped uh, students. So there'd be people, a lot of people in wheelchairs or bed, motorized beds. And there was tunnels under the whole school. So we'd sneak into the tunnels in the middle of the night and just mob through the whole tunnel system because you're not going to run, run into anyone. And then the security guards would finally find you and chase you and whatnot. It's sort of a, a game of cat and mouse. But we'd like, it wasn't a big university at all, but we were, there was like five or six of us, I think, in total after a while. And we were like, we were the rollerbladers on campus. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. What um, what was the uh, Air- Airborne audition about? Uh, sorry, you broke up. What was that? Oh, the uh, Airborne a- audition. Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I okay? What was that about? Yeah. <laughs> when was that? <laughs> yeah. When was that? Sorry, what was that about? Was that? Like, what was the oh. experience? Oh, so, I mean, it was, it was crazy and weird and I didn't know exactly what to make of it. Just like, there's going to be a movie filmed in Cincinnati, go try to be a part of it. You know, Team Rollerblade will be there. So it was just cool to like, kind of see some people you saw in some magazines and then just skate with people. And I, I remember the first audition, there was a mini ramp and Just D was skating it and he had, uh, Kryptonics, uh, little wheels i forget what they're they were called they were just like coming out with them at the time because grinding was just kind of a thing i actually have yeah. to show you guys something Ooh. um so grinding we were like just start trying to start to grind but we didn't know exactly what to do so what we used to do is take out our third wheel and i only have this out because i forgot to put it back and it was sitting right behind me this is an h block that we would take our wheel out i don't know if you could see this mm-hmm this is what we used to to skate in. You take the third wheel out and put this thing in, and that's how we what? do grinds. Basically, on our, yeah, on our third wheel. And this kid, he called his company No Hype, and he even got a tattoo on his head about it. <laughs> so on that today, no idea who he is. Bless you, Billy. Um, but Thank that's you. like when I did my first hand rail. That's what I did it with, like without my third wheel. Yo, that, that's crazy. Me and Billy both been skating for like 25 years. And if I'm judging from your reaction. You've never seen that before either, right? No, I've never seen that. i never seen Was that like a legit, like widespread, like was that widespread sold in like shops or was that like a local buddy in Ohio? No, it's a local dude. Um, just a local dude sold it in Ohio. That is, And that's like one of what, one? How many, how many of those do you have? I, I, I know I have this pair. Um, <laughs> Still in the packaging. Yeah, sort of. It's coming out. But yeah, it's in good history. That is really wow. sick. Oh, yeah. Amazing. yeah. But then when I saw Jess with his little wheels, I was like, oh, man, that looks way easier. <laughs> and later on, I, it was. But those auditions, um, so, they were they're cool. Yeah. Uh, what was uh did you <laughs> there's a lot of leg going on right i was gonna, I was ask, gonna say is, is is that when you am i lagging no i think it's like on the back okay. end or something okay yeah. um well was that where you met a lot of the guys um through the audition at um in cincinnati yeah so chris edwards obviously pat parnell chris mitchell just darren forth those were like the main guys you would know jimmy trimble sorry um there was like roger saki was another guy that was in there uh we're getting some like real old school rollerblade guys names that were just like i don't even think they're stunts kids i think they're on the dance team and they were just involved somehow um but yeah those were like the main guys um that you that i guess the mo- the, the more present guys that were there and Mitchell and I became really good friends during the, the shoot. They initially, they had put me in a hotel in Kentucky across the river with 
um, just the rest of the crew and all the other skaters were in the hotel because there's only like me and like two other local guys and the other two local guys lived in Cincinnati so they didn't need a hotel and so I kept I was like all bummed because they'd go out skating at night after shooting all day and I was like all bummed out about it and talking to Mitchell about it. he's like oh just come stay with me and I was like, all right so I just hopped across the river and started staying with everyone else and and it was like it was got really fun man mm. and it wasn't like partying and crazy stuff like that it was just skating and just being around like this a bunch of people you know from california that like make a living doing this and just experiencing that like it was it was pretty fun um so i know that was with uh team rollerblade that whole thing but if i'm not mistaken at least I used to think you skated for Oxygen, right? I did, yes. How, yes, did, uh, that how was, did that end up coming to be? Uh, so I moved to California in November 93. Um, in summer of 94 is NIS. And NIS is like the first skate series, professional skate series. And... Uh, so Rosie's was starting to get in the game at this time. And then I don't remember. It must have been Brooke. It had to have been Brooke. He, someone contacted him um, that worked for Oxygen. Oxygen was owned by Atomic. And if you know anything about skiing, Atomic is a uh, is big in the ski industry. Um, they produce skis and boots. They had Koflock boots, Atomic skis. So you know, sort of natural for that kind of a company to get into inlines because inlines were getting so big. So they were coming out with rec skates and they wanted to, to do an aggressive skate. So Brooke designed most of that skate. And then he kind of got the team together, myself and Bentley and Manuel and Tosh. I think we were the first ones. Um, and then like Corey Nelson came on after and others. But we helped kind of design it and, and refine it and make changes to the to the production model that first came out. I'm always curious how those like uh, like to design a skate yourself. You know, we were talking about Chris Edwards with that when he designed the uh, Daytona. Um, what do you remember from like the design process of the oxygen? Because that was a really unique design, even by today's standards of that particular boot. Yeah. Brooke sure. in his sketchbooks. Um, I think Brooke would send him sketches. And they would go off Brooks sketches and then they sent a mold to us. And we, I don't even know if it was skatable at first. And then we kind of said, Oh, this needs to look like this, or this needs to be wider, whatnot. And they would make some changes. Um, I remember they did something once without asking us, which seems kind of weird. And they kind of screwed it up and we're like, no, you can't do that. And it was like a $50,000, like screw up. Because molds, you know, yeah, they did something to the mold itself, and then, yeah, then they had to go and fix it. Oh man, serious mistakes back then. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a heck of a skate. I, I skated uh, a lot of versions of that skate: the Argon, the Low Top. The I loved that skate me, in its me day. Too. Me too. But that must have been some oh, yeah. creation process. Did that come from like a ski boot? Like who who thought that thing was a bulky, big, big old thing? But it yeah. worked great. It was a heck of a backslide. I'll yeah, tell you that. good Royale, definitely good Royale. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Insane. Uh, it was all Brooke. Brooke was the one that that designed that did the base design of it, and he grew up skiing, so that sort of fits. <laughs> what was with the uh, design of the those soul plates, like the metal soul? Now, now we're getting on to oxygen, whatever. But I got so many questions about the design of that skate because it was I, truly so unique. It had little think, metal soul plates on it and stuff. Yeah. yeah, I think we it was just something we wanted to be different, and uh, that it was. <laughs> oh, definitely was. Um, those had those issues as well, but they. I thought I thought they were pretty cool. So you still like wrap around the boot too. I remember correctly. And then they, I think they made them in plastic after a while. Yeah, yeah. The second generation, I think, came in plastic. I love, yeah. like, even the lacing yeah. and everything on that skate, even though it was so different at its time, I think it was a bit advanced. And 
at the time yeah. it was super big, bulky, heavy, but you put one on nowadays and it's like the lightest skate you've ever put on your foot. It's so weird how yeah. it changed over years. We also had like these like 60 year old men that had been like making ski boots their whole lives, uh, doing the, like taking Brooks design and, and making it reality. So we had, we had people like comp very competent people, like actually making the boot and their whole, their whole, uh, ski boot, um, process, which, which the liners were really comfortable from what I remember. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, they, we're, they were good. You know, fortunate. And we yeah. got to go to Austin um, every once in a while. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I kind of don't want to jump straight into this, but, but I kind of want to know because I'm very curious about hoax too. How did that all come to be? Because that was a major, like I said in the beginning of the episode, that was like such a turning point uh, for skating. I didn't even know at the time because it was my first video. But, you know, the guys from before me, like Ray Mendez and John Ortiz were telling me like, oh, that was such a big thing. And I was able to look back in time and see the shift and how powerful that was for the culture. So um, were you like a part of like the inception of that idea? How did like the whole crew come together? How did that thing come to be? I, I definitely wasn't like, I doubt I was part of the, uh, the initial idea. Um, cause when I came out, when I moved out to California, they were just filming the hoax. And then I think it was, you know, probably something like with Evan or Brooke getting together and be like, we got to do something big and do something cool. And it was probably Evan's idea. He, he seems to be, uh, the one that would come up with something like this. Cause it, like at the time, like, I mean, videos at the time were, were just a, a thing. Like just getting a video done, but like getting people in a van and going cross country, like that was sort of unheard of. Um, and I, I don't remember much, but I want to say like Arlo and Brooke and Evan and Craig got together and like figured it out and they're like, okay, we'll get like five guys and two camera guys and, and Evan and Craig made the, the, the route happened like where we went like we had no no idea where we were going they just i think they just uh called people and and uh they're like yeah come on by or whatever and we just would go there that's such a crazy concept for that time because there's no internet there's no text messaging like yeah. let people know where you're going to be it's just straight up right around on a bus and that's it yeah and i think a lot of it had to do with hoax like like shops that bought a lot of hoax movies. They're like, okay, we're going to do this other video. Do you, should we come to your area? And I think it was something like that. If, if they sold a lot of videos in this one town, we we're going to go there. Yeah. That was also Makes a sense. different time too, where the skate shops were yeah. a thing to do that too. Yeah. It was crazy. That was such a fun tour. How long was that? I was always curious how long that was. Five weeks, I believe. Damn, seems it it seems yeah. like months. Yeah. I thought it was like a whole summer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it felt like it. It's five weeks. Like we started in LA, went to San Diego, then up to San Francisco, then to Salt Lake. Did we go to Denver? <laughs> seems, seems like a good place to go after Salt Lake. <laughs> yep. Then yep. Minnesota. Chicago, and then we went down to like, I think from Chicago, we went to Dallas, or maybe to Arkansas, then Dallas. And Arkansas was crazy. So we were running late, you know, as as you do on tour. And we were all just beat. And we're like, oh, this is going to be a bummer. There's no one going to be here. Like, this is going to suck. We're two hours late, or three, maybe even. And we're in the middle of Arkansas and uh, we like roll up to this shop and there's like the parking lots filled with people. They're just waiting for us. And we're like, holy mm -hmm. shit. Like we, we got to, we got to skate. <laughs> and it was on, it was like, it, it actually wasn't a, an issue. We we're like so juiced on like all the people that showed up and uh, the, there was a little mini ramp there. There's some clips from it in the movie, but it was like, it was insane. Like stuff like that would happen. Like we'd come late, not because 
we were trying to be late, but you know how it is on the road. Uh, and then like, there'd be like tons of kids there just waiting for us. And it's, it was pretty rad. Uh, Billy, you might be muted. You don't hear him, do you? Okay, there you go. Hello? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. And, 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 and this is before cell phones. So like when you're running late, it's not like you can call and say, hey, we're an hour or two behind. It's just like how the road is. There's no pager. There's yeah. no internet. So it's just kind of people are waiting, hoping you show up. Oh, they were supposed to be here at this time. And then, mm. yeah, that's cool. I mean, there was definitely a rock star element to that. Like it seemed like so many stops had such a rock star element. You know, I think of... Uh, the San Jose bit with Julio and then Minnesota and New York, obviously. Mm-hmm. But what what was that experience like being thrust into like this rock star kind of thing with these guys? It, it was, for me, it was very weird. And like, um, I'm an introvert, so I'm not, you know, and like you get like Arlo, Brooke and Brian and B and they're like, yeah, <laughs> they're a bunch of extroverts. So like they loved it. And I just like, you know, I liked skating and it it was fun, but it was a little weird, like being like thrown on that pedestal for me. Weird how? Like, uh, just, it just feels uncomfortable. Like, oh, and then there's also like, oh, now I have to skate and I have to, (laughs) so it's also a little stressful too. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. you like people there's expectations mm-hmm. so yeah sometimes like is- like i remember when we were in minnesota and we we're skating with the guys uh steve thomas and all them like that wasn't pressure that was fun and that's just us out street skating and like just having a good time like those sessions like throughout the movie you see were like super fun um and i think most of the movie is stuff like that there's there's not a lot of like demo yeah footage which we, I don't, we didn't really have a ton of demo stuff to, to, to really do. Like most skate shops we went to were just there to hang out. Um, but yeah, when we were out just skating, um, it was definitely less pressure. It was fun. It looked like it was mostly street skating. And I, I know a few guys mentioned it throughout the movie, how it was cool to see this new sport spread throughout the, the world of the country and seeing everybody push in a different different level, you know, because at that time, skating was so new. There was like, for anyone who hasn't oh, seen yeah. it, there's like two tricks in the whole video, but it's an hour and a half long, you know? It's like soul and frontside variations, pretty much the whole <laughs> video. But it's crazy to see yeah. the level of skating. And even throughout the course of the video, you see it progressing. And that looked like it was everybody's highlight during the time, you know? to see that the sport grow itself. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, easily. It, it was fun to see like just every town you go to what the scene was like, um, how many kids were there, what, if there are any new tricks, just try to make up new stuff. Like we were kind of toying around with like spinning into grinds at the time. Like it was very early on. <laughs> I like how you just said you showing up to spots, w- wondering if people had like new tricks. That's that was legit something yeah. that was going on through your heads. Kind of like because it was such a, a a big time in skating. Like people were inventing stuff all the time, and the, there was no uh, internet like there is today, where you're like just watching movies all the time of kids all over the world. Like you don't, we didn't know what everyone was doing in New York. You know, unless someone from New York came out or someone from L.A. went there. So it was, it was definitely exciting or like, you know, I remember at the at So at the end of that um, tour, Arlo and I actually went to Cleveland and visit some family Then actually went to Dayton for Am Jam. And shoot, I forget who it was. I think it was Dan Jensen was doing zero spins. And we're like, like mine's blown. <laughs> Guys just going off the long tramp backwards and landing backwards. <laughs> What's going on here? You know, wow. stuff like that. Like that's awesome. That would happen. <laughs> so, yeah. And it was so cool. Cause you're like, Oh, like I thought we invented everything. <laughs> yeah. So crazy to think about that. That is a yeah. good one. Just yeah. the simple concept I, I, of going backwards off a ramp. Yeah, exactly. That's cr- That's incredible. 
I think I feel like I remember even like back then my learning. I feel like I was trying 360 before 180s. Like even in those days, I just, I just feels like whatever. I don't know. Going backwards was a later learned skill when you were like a grommet. Maybe I don't know. At least that was my experience at that um, time. Yeah, but yeah, that I mean, I think it's super interesting too that. Uh, you're saying you're such an introvert and you're like with these like huge personalities on this like super epic tour. Like I, I remember looking at the New York part and being like, what the hell? This guy's like front flipping off the van into like a crowd of people. Like this is just inc super. I mean, I, I know that was a lot of people's first videos and it sold like, I don't know. I heard some crazy number, but a lot, you know, like yeah. I think like, yeah, I heard something like 20,000. I could be wrong, 25,000, but I heard I it sold it like a lot of copies. I thought it was like 150 from what I remember reading. But I, that's a, I don't know if the number's on that right now anyway. Wow. I want to say 25 or 30, but I don't remember either. Yeah. Oh, New, um, New York sounds crazy. <laughs> that was fun. I had my cast. I, well, I got my cast in New York. I broke my wrist in Minnesota, and then I skated with a broken wrist till we got to New York. And there was, oh man. And then Brian broke his wrist in Boston. But we were in New York and we went, there was this doctor girl and she got us into like the ER and like had this doctor put casts on us. And it was all on like the down low. It's like, <laughs> and I think she was just a resident at the time. And she was friends with all the New York skaters. I forget her name, shoot. But she hooked us up with some casts. Yeah, we need that now for all us skaters without uh, insurance all these years. Right? It should be like a gray market um, medical field for American skaters who have no health insurance, which is like, I'm sure, 50% uh, of us at least. <laughs> yeah. Were you guys getting, because it wasn't, it was like an independent, I guess, tour, the hoax. It wasn't like a... Uh, an oxygen tour, rollerblade tour, something like that. Were you guys getting paid for this or was this like all straight for fun? Like how that worked? Uh, no. So when they, when they did the thing, it was actually only supposed to be four skaters, uh, Arlo, Brooke, Brian, and myself. And they're like, okay, um, I forget. We didn't get paid much. Two grand or something. I don't know. 2,500. Uh, and then we're like, but, but B loved on this tour, so we all took an equal pay cut, so B can come on the tour. Hmm. Um, so then there was five. But yeah, it was just like a one, like a they paid us X amount of dollars, and we're like, okay, we'll go on your bus. Yeah, it's it's hard to judge like a pay scale back then too, because skating wasn't really blowing up yet, and it was also thirty years oh, yeah. ago, so it's hard to judge that. Yeah. I think very much. A lot of There's factors. Yeah, like, oh, you want to play us? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably one of the first times you guys ever really got paid skating, maybe. Oh, yeah. I will miss. And I think Arlo is probably on Roses by then. And it was, well, probably was it 95, Hoax 2? 95, yeah. Okay, that's yeah, when this happened. I, say, I think we left in April or May. Maybe late April. I don't remember. And it was till like May or beginning of June, something like that. Not even a summer tour. Yeah. <laughs> Kids are still in school and shit. What, one of, we did it. I, I would love to see the cameras that they were using. You know, um, you, I just saw the footage oh. from the cameras, but I would like to see the cameras they were using and what they were filming with. Yeah, they had a lot of cool 60 millimeter beta, cameras and like shit. Beta cam, like, well, we had this one huge beta cam that was huge i mean you see it in, in some of the shots and then evan had a 16 mil film mm -hmm. camera and then we had like a bunch of high eights and uh whatnot but there's some like a lot of money in cameras and a lot of tape that they taped over eventually <laughs> <laughs> I, I was super inspired by the way that hoax films were shot and i even try to mimic some of it and when he made uh the truth videos too um if anybody ever noticed that with like the super slow-mo wide angle shots and and film look and all that stuff, you know, it was definitely that 60 millimeter footage was something I definitely try to mimic a lot, you know, back in my video making days. Yeah, I think a lot of that's Evan. Uh, he's, he's amazing at what he does. And he's still doing it. I don't know if you know what he does now, but he's like doing all this TV production stuff. 
that's good that he ended up in that career. It makes sense. He like shoots all the expedition unknowns and naked and afraid. Man, and man like versus that. wild, I think too, something like that. Yeah. Oh damn. All the stuff. Adventure photographer or videographer. Damn, that's awesome. There's a, yeah. a another highlight for me that I always took back from the hoax videos where like so many future talents were discovered during those tours and like like John Julio, uh, Brian Bell was in a lot of it, Matt Mance and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, do you have any yeah. memories with people like that who were pretty much unknown to the time you guys met for the first time? They ended up being like some of the top pros in the industry later on or like your friends? Oh, yeah. So when we get up to San Jose and we're skating with John, we broke up into some groups, some smaller groups. And it was like me, John, maybe one of his friends. And I think um, Craig was shooting. And I just remember, like, John, first, I forget what rail we were skating, but I was like, this guy's really good. <laughs> he's, he's a lot better than me. <laughs> he just had, like, he was just going for it. And I don't know if he was just, like, pumped to be there or what, but obviously he's John Julio, and he's an incredible skater. But I just remember, like, like wow, he's a lot better than me. <laughs> Arlo kind of had a similar yeah. story, too, about that, meeting John, how good he was. Yeah. Yeah. And he still is. Yeah, like um, to your point before, like when you go places, it's all a surprise. You don't know who's going to be better than you if they're inventing new tricks. Um, what was it like seeing the New York scene? Because that was like a huge scene during that time and, you know, wild and crazy. And uh, you guys seem to really mesh well with the guys. Like, you know, the the battle with Rollinson and Calvin just seemed to be quite oh. an experience. So uh, what, what was that yeah. like? Was that your first time in New York or was it just uh, had you been there before? Or? That was my very first time in New York, uh, New York City. I think most of us, except for Brian Smith, who used to live there. But it was crazy and awesome. And I've, I've, no, I've met some New York skaters uh, through Nis, so it wasn't like I didn't know anyone out there. But just the whole experience, like, like there's no other place in, on planet Earth that's like New York City. It's awesome. It's different. It's its, its own entity, and that's what makes it so cool. And it was pretty crazy. And that whole Calvin Rollinson thing was awesome. Just how it went down and, you know, you got to pay up. So Rollinson paid up. <laughs> yeah. What about uh, some, some of the, I hate to keep going through, but I just don't want to drop until I get some questions answered. What about the Brook and, and Brian Smith beef? Was that real? What was that like? Uh, was there some tension between the guys on tour at all? So that was, that was real. Um, I won't say what caused it, but the underlying issue was they both are uh, type A personalities and they're they're fighting for who's the funniest or whatever. Um, and one person said something and the other one didn't like it and they just lost it. <laughs> and that was in, it was like in Salt Lake or something. It wasn't like we were like on tour like four days or five days and Brian's like, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> It was fine. But it was like the underlying thing was we're living in this, you know, Winnebago and some egos got in the way of each other. I feel like it's usually bound to happen on tour when you're just in a confined space with the same people for so long or on the road like 10 hours a day. Yeah. And I, honestly, after that, there was no issue. I don't think there was one other issue. That was it? Just the one with, with Brooke with a knife? That was yeah. like it? Yeah. Just that one. I mean, as far as like us getting mad at each other, I mean, there was like Arlo put some candles on the the dashboard of the Winnebago in Atlanta, and they put holes in the dashboard. So there was like incidents like that that like Craig was really mad about. <laughs> but eh, what are you gonna do? Well, um, I, I feel satisfied with the hoax too. Maybe we'll come back to it. But let's talk about uh, Senate. Wow, sure. what a movement. I remember going to the uh, the Staten Island Mall. I would walk into Pacific Sunwear, and there it was, Senate. Mm -hmm. I was so yeah. proud to be a rollerblader. It was everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, like a real force of at the time. So what was it like to be a part of that? And you were you were there from the beginning, right? I feel like you're there from the beginning of Oxygen. You're there from the beginning of yeah. Senate and all these incredible yeah. companies. I, I, yeah, a lot of people thought I used to own part of it. I only had a nickel for every time. Um <laughs> 
so but i was basically there from from the the beginning talks of when when brooke and arlo were talking about it and then got heineken involved um and then when like arlo just started making shirts and like all that stuff happened when we were we were living at spawn ranch which a little backstory about spawn ranch is aaron spawn had this rented this house in westchester california which is just north of lax uh and there's a vert ramp in the backyard and it seemed like everyone lived there at one point <laughs> if they paid rent or not they, they lived there uh so we were all living in this house and they come they came up with the idea and heineken was more the business guy so he moved over and they produced like a run of shirts and then bk got involved because i think his dad does something or did something with machinery and they made he made the grind plates the original grind plates that were blank they're just metal i remember we were in the back porch with ziploc bags uh a stapler and some tags that they made at kinko's you know like senate grind plates or something and just putting them in bags you know uh no way yeah it was like a little production line going on <laughs> do you have any of and those like, that'd be sick if you had some of those still i doubt it <laughs> i've got a box of things somewhere but i don't think i have any of those unfortunately that would be some I epic nostalgia. BK, does. bk probably does oh that'd be some epic nostalgia right there some hand-packed yeah. senate goods from the boys yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was but then then when they did their deal with bravo like things just obviously exploded and, and got big real quick and then i like in the beginning i was like going to the meetings hanging out like in in the meetings with all the owners and and then it was like hey we're gonna need you to sit outside for a bit <laughs> like, all right mm -hmm. I'm not in the boys club, but, uh, <laughs> but it was cool. It was fun. It was, it was, a um, obviously a huge company. It was cool to, to be able to represent them at the time. Um, until it wasn't, <laughs> but it was fun. Um, I, what about spawn ranch? I've heard so many things about spawn ranch. It's like a, like a legend behind it in the early days. Um, yeah. So, Who all lived there, and like, how so, big was this place? What was the, what was the facility like? It was a four bedroom, two bath house. Uh, it wasn't that big. I mean, maybe twelve hundred square foot. I don't know. It had a little small detached one car garage out back, and then a little backyard where they had two vert ramps at one point, and this old. Aaron Spawn was a old roller skater and him and his and a couple of buddies, roller skating buddies lived at this house and they'd roller skate on this vert ramp. And then Mark Shays moved in there. And Arlo, like when I moved to California, um, Chris Mitchell and Mark Shays called me one night and they're like, Hey, do you want to move to California? I was like, yeah. And they're like, okay, your rent is going to be 300 bucks a month. And there's a vert ramp next door it's like okay sounds great I'll, see, <laughs> I'll be out there in like a month and so arlo and i actually initially moved next door to this house um with this crazy lady named jenna and this other roommate named doug who was a drummer and a welder and jenna was like the crate like your typical crazy cat lady and we lived there for like a year or so before we moved, like other people moved out of Spawn Ranch and like like the old roller skaters moved out and we kind of all moved in. And Aaron still like, he, he was the, had the lease on it. So that's why we called it Spawn Ranch. And they they just tore down, when I moved out there, they just tore down the um, one vert ramp and they just had that nine foot. And that's where I learned to, to skate a vert ramp. And it was insane. like couple miles from LAX so people were flying in we're like yeah we'll pick you up we'll be there in five minutes and it was sort of just the hub and people would like stay for all summer long Scott Bentley like pitched a tent out back and stayed all mm -hmm. summer long but it was I mean it was awesome because you're always skating you're you'd go skate the vert ramp or we had a, a little practice rally dragging to the street um 
would be skating that or go street skating somewhere. There's always somewhere, something to do skating wise. You said that. Yeah, it seems like a heck of an experience during like a really special time. Oh man, it was, yeah, it was great. You, you said that you learned how to skate a vert ramp there. Was that before you rode Oxygen? Because I, I was just thinking about Oxygen and how, yes. yeah, because the lineup, I don't know how this happened or if it was coincidence or not, but it seemed like most of the pros, at least for Oxygen, were all vert skaters, like Scott Bentley, Manuel Blaris, Tasha, you, you yourself, like you had to be down with those guys, I guess, kind of. Yeah, well, the only way to make money in the early, early 90s was to skate vert. So Rollerblade came up with this show concept. They had a stunt team and they had a dance team. And people would hire Rollerblade to do the shows for, you know, at a, at a convention center or in front of their shop or whatever. And the dance team would do their thing in front of the vert ramp. And then the stunt team would do a, a choreographed vert show. So that was kind of a thing where other companies started to do this. Rossi's did it. Uh, the first time I skated for Oxygen, um, I got flown to Munich for ISPO, and we didn't even have skates. I, I We were using, I don't even know what skates we were using, to be honest. I don't think there were even Oxygen brand skates. There were some like rec skate, but we had to do vert demos on this weird skate, me, and Brooke and I think Arlo. Yeah, Arlo is before Rosses. Um, so you kind of had to, to make any money at first. You had to learn how to skateboard. Mm. Wow. And you had the perfect fun. place for it too. Spawns yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we'd, we'd skate vert almost every day and then go skate street and it was all right. <laughs> So now you figured out how to make money off skating in the early '90s. Now we got to figure out how to make money off skating in the early '20s, 2020s. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't think I don't think that's the answer anymore. No, <laughs> unless you're Ato or Takeshi. Yeah, those those guys. Yeah, I hope, they made I, it work. I hope they're still making money because they people with that talent deserve to be making big bucks. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so how to make money in the early 2000s or 2020? Oh, it's like, like now, like tw early 2020s. <laughs> well, I was funny. I was talking to Julio the other day. It's like, man, if there's only like need to figure out what this industry needs, you know, not besides a skate. And he just sort of laughed. He's like, like everyone's trying to figure that one out right now. <laughs> everyone's trying to crack the code. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, you don't want to like start another boot company, but like, there's gotta be something. Um, well, I mean, yeah. sure, sure it all goes hand in hand, but it's not so much making money off a product as much as it is the athletes themselves making money, you know? Yeah, exactly. Cause that's what's, I'm sure it all goes hand in hand too, but that is definitely what's in my eyes, most important. I agree. Um, you've done some really cool trips during that time. You've you've traveled a bit of the world through skating. Um, what's so grateful? What what's been some of your favorite trips? Um, there's been a lot. Uh, when I was a team manager for Roses, for, I did that for two or three years. <clears throat> I was traveling a lot overseas. Um, like a ton of trips here and there and I was still judging and doing all this stuff, but probably my favorite thing I've ever done, uh, was my, the two times I coached the Thai team for this really weird event they had in Asia called the Asian indoor games, but it's sanctioned by the IOC the international Olympic committee. So it was like, it was the real deal. Mm -hmm. And Thailand hosted the first one in 2005. And I've been to Thailand before for, um, just some other things. My daughter's saying something. Do you have father duties to attend to? <laughs> no, I think I'm good. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I got this random job through a guy named Apichat, who I've known from my previous previous trips to Thailand. He kind of ran action sports in Thailand. It's like, yeah, hey, we're looking for a. a a coach, I was like, 
I'll be your coach. And he's like, well, okay, can you suggest anyone else? I was like, I don't want to, but <laughs> I did. Anyway, I ended up getting the job. And so I went and lived in Thailand for three months and coached uh, Jirasak, Warpod, Cesar, uh, Warpod's brother Goop, and a bunch of other young kids. And what year it was, was the this? Most amazing, what's that? What year are we talking? 2005. Okay. And it was, it was awesome to wake up in this foreign country where it's really hard to communicate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one knows English. And it was, but it was really fun and exciting. And it was this crazy cool experience. And then I did it again, 2007. And they were looking for a skateboard coach. And I got my buddy, Eric Kirkwood to do the skateboard coach. And it was, he made that, that experience different because, um, he was so into it as well. He's, if you know Eric, he's such a fun guy to be around. He loves skateboarding. He just likes everything about the culture and then like loves traveling. And so it was super fun to be with somebody who wanted that experience as well. And so we were learning the language a bunch and just having a good old time at it and coaching our kids. He was doing his thing, I was doing mine. And it was just an amazing experience and just like meeting, meeting friends and eating weird food and having a good time. That definitely sounds like a good trip. Thailand's one of the very few places in the world that I've actually considered living and I still uh, might one day, but, uh, that, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't know if this is common knowledge or I'm just an idiot, but is this where your nickname coach came from or was it something else? No. So it just, that nickname just sort of helped, uh, <laughs> help me maybe get the job. No, uh, Tom Heiser and Andy Cruz, uh, are responsible. So in the, I think it was around 95, 96, I had these black rim glasses. I wear glasses most of the time. And one day, I don't remember if it was Andy or Tom, but when I was like, you look like a coach and we're gonna call you coach as they give everyone nicknames. Mm -hmm. And so it just stuck and they just always called me coach. So that's where coach came from. And then it just sort of I don't know, my destiny. I filled my destiny. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you wore glasses, they, you got a nickname yeah. coach. <laughs> That's a funny and one. The prophecy was fulfilled. <laughs> ended up being yeah. a coach. I'm, I'm so you me. were saying, um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, go on. No, I was saying, uh, you were saying that you didn't, um, you did not speak Thai and the, and the guys didn't speak English. So how was it a challenge to be a coach uh, that way or? Well, Note, Note is Warpod. That's his nickname is yeah. Note. Um, he spoke pretty decent English. And Cesar spoke okay English. Um, Jurasek, barely any. He'd understand more. Um, so I'd, I'd mostly go like work with Note a lot and like have him uh, be my translator. And I used the first time I went out there, I actually used a video camera to help me like that way I can go back and like detail what they were doing wrong and then have note right next to me, like telling them in Thai, like what you need to do better, whatever. Um, so it was a bit of a challenge, but it wasn't too bad because note really wanted to learn more English too. And he was like always asking, Oh, how do you like, what is this and what is that? So he was super into it and I was super into trying to learn some Thai and I got decent at it. I mean, I couldn't really like, have a conversation, but I learned a lot of words and it was, it was fun to be able to like pick up things here and there. That's multiple challenges right there. Not just learning a language, but being able to communicate with people too and teach something, yeah. which is like yeah. hard enough. Yeah. But it, it was good. Like it, the event itself was weird because I couldn't have all my guys skating. It was, I want to say there was three events. It was like street, like a park course, vert ramp, maybe a best trick or a high air or something. And I can only have two skaters in each event. And it's like, well, Jura's second like note are the best two skaters, but Cesar is also really good. And Note's brother, Goop, is really good as well. Like, I didn't want to just put the two in all the events. So I had to kind of split them up. And uh, it worked out. Like, they, they, and, 
Thailand, I was technically working for the Sports Authority of Thailand, and they were giving cash prizes if you got a medal to uh, the skaters. And if you got a gold medal, you got a million baht in 2005 and that was $25,000, which is, whoa, whoa, goes a long way. Yeah. And like Jurisak got, I think he won at least one gold and maybe two bronzes or a silver and a bronze. And the 2007, I think they halved everything. I think he only got uh, like 500,000 baht for gold, but, um, he, he won more money then. And so did note. Uh, Cesar did win a gold, and then he got it taken away because he failed a drug test. Oh no way! <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, that was a bummer. <laughs> oh um, wow, Dan, these people were making big bucks back then. Uh, well, they could, yeah, in this they could, one yeah. event. But that you also got to understand, like, and there's it was only for Asian countries. So there's kids from like Malaysia and Singapore, um, Japan and Taiwan and China, India had some people there um and i don't know what other countries were doing but for thailand they were giving bonuses if you won which i thought was really awesome because a lot of these guys didn't come from a lot of money so it really helped them out i know note bought his dad a truck he was able to do that um and they all i think they all did really nice stuff for their families that seems very appropriate to the asian that- culture yeah <laughs> But he, yeah, he failed. A, I'm, I'm seeing in the chat right now. He failed the drug test for smoking weed. Yeah. So. Oh. He, so <laughs> we had, we had talks about this. <laughs> so we literally like group t- talks in Thai about like there was a, a pharmacist guy like don't eat this because it has whatever in it. Don't you know uh, take this or that or obviously don't smoke pot. And so he, like, Cesar's an okay vert skater. He's Back then he wasn't anything special. The Asatokas weren't there either. Um, but there's these two kids from China that were much better. But they both fell in the finals. And Cesar had two solid runs. And so he ends up winning. And we're all stoked. And, like, some guy's like, okay, let's go do your P-test. And so I'm walking. I have to, like, go there with him. And we're walking thing and he's like oh no i'm like what did you do <laughs> and he tells me what happens i was like oh you son of a there's nothing i can do about it like i'm like we already had the conversations and apparently like a night or two before like you know as you do you're hanging out with a bunch of people and someone's got a joint and they're passing it around and so he you know partakes so obviously his drug test fails and we get word of it then we have to go back to bank because the event was in Supenbury, which was two hours north of bangkok we have to go back to bangkok and like meet with a panel of people and this is it was such a weird thing we go to like we're in some fancy hotel in the middle of bangkok we go to some room we walk in it's just black and there's like a guy in the corner and i'm just waiting to get killed I'm like, this is weird. Like, there's no, like, the drapes are all closed. I'm like, what's going on? What? And it, was, it was really weird. It was really weird. And then all of a sudden, this door opens to, like, a conference room. And, like, these Kazakhstan athletes come out because they all failed their drug tests. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we go in. And we made up some stupid story. And, of course, they didn't believe us. And he lost his medal. And everyone that was below just got moved up. So uh, it's little, yeah, it was heartbreaking. And then he uh, he he lives in San Francisco now. <laughs> have you have you stayed in touch? Uh, yeah, I actually saw him a few months ago. Him and Cameron uh, Talbot came out like three or so months ago, four months ago maybe, um, to sk- skate with Carell here um, for Bloom and hang out and I, I hadn't seen him in a number of years probably some volo premiere in san francisco i don't remember when but yeah he's doing all right he's a he's a cook at a thai restaurant skating a bit he's got the best the best style caesar he's he's nice. at the steez they all got amazing style yeah i love waropod uh, style too so good yeah 
I'd like to claim that I taught Warpod and Jerasek. I taught them everything, but I <laughs> But they're both, they're so amazing. They're both two completely different humans and both so awesome at the same time. It's so great to, I was so fortunate to, to not just know them, but just to be become like I call my little brothers. So they're great guys. That they are. I, I uh, about the, the topic of like smoking weed and getting disqualified. I remember that was a big controversy when skateboarding was announced that it was going to be in the Olympics because obviously smoking weed is like a big part of everyday life, I guess, for a lot of these people. And that was going to be a huge thing for the Olympics, skateboarding being in there. Yeah. And I don't know what ever happened. I'm sure it's still illegal. Uh, the laws are changing like every month. I mean, at least yeah, in right. the United States, but that's like a worldwide thing in the Olympics, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. That'll be tough. That'll be tough. Mm. I mean, it's not a performance enhancing drug, so yeah. it, it is a little yeah. weird, but um, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll let that go. Hopefully in the future, the Olympics can see reason. <laughs> we'll let that go. We're but, not going to involve the Olympics. We'll let that go, though. We'll let that go. <laughs> we'll, we'll let that go. We'll let that go. Um, but that's, that's cool. You did that for two years, and... Uh, you did a bunch of judging too for like a, a while, right? Like uh, well, Asian X Games and things like that. Yes. Um, sorry, I texted my wife. Uh, so I used to get nice shirt, by the way. During the, what's that? Nice shirt, oh, by the way. I it's love not, that shirt. <laughs> Cleveland. <laughs> it's not that bad. Yeah. Have a beer. <laughs> True story. Um, so I used to get hurt a lot, and I couldn't skate back in the '90s, late '90s, early 2000s. So I, I ended up just judging, and then when I got out of um, competing, I just ended up judging a lot, and I would do uh, a lot of like. So in X Games, they they had an Asian X Games, but they'd have all these X Games qualifiers. And what they would do is they'd send like one BMX or one skateboarder, one rollerblader over to like be a head judge and do demos. And so since I could still skate at a decent level, I usually went because I could do the demos, whereas some of the other guys that were judging just didn't want to do the demos or didn't think they were good enough. So I got to go to like, you know, Malaysia for the weekend, you know, stupid stuff like that. For the weekend. And I did that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'd leave. I'd leave like on a Wednesday, get there on a Thursday, uh, or sometimes leave on a Thursday, get there on a Friday. The event was Saturday, Sunday, and leave on Monday. Oof. Like it was insane. But the crew was amazing in Asia. Like this Australian guy ran the ESPN things for Asia, and he was hilarious. And he was super chill to work with. Uh, you can go out, have your fun, just, you know, be on site, do your job. And, you know, the other times just whatever, you know, have a good time. Mm -hmm. And then and a lot of the, the skateboarders, a lot of the, there's one guy that mostly did the skateboarding, one guy that mostly did the BMX. So usually it was like the same group that I was with and we all got along really well. And it was just, just made the trips really fun. Um, I actually, I, I want to ask you about something I'm personally curious about, like, uh, your, like, I know you've been, you've been involved in skating forever, still are. Um, but I want to talk about something little on the side of your career that, that you did that I, I, I thought was really interesting. You were a distiller for a while and then you were a brewer for a, a long time. Um, still I think that's a really interesting, yeah, still, I'm, I'm, I think it's a really interesting, uh, Korea, I've actually had some of your own distilled whiskey. Uh, it was in a mason jar, still clear. Hadn't been barrel touched yet. Yeah, at wow. the uh, blading cup years back. But I'm just curious oh, yeah, how, like, how you got into it. Yeah. Really? It's really good. Uh, so 2008, I couldn't find a job. <laughs> you know, the market crashed. <laughs> like, I couldn't find a bartending gig. I was living in San Pedro at the time. And I... I was looking for a job. I, I kind of got a job actually at my first brewery in San Pedro or in Torrance, but I didn't, I wasn't doing anything that had to do with making beer. I was literally this brewer's like assistant where I was just cleaning up after him. 
I still didn't know how to make beer at the time. I was interested in it. I like to drink it. Um, <laughs> I, knew nothing, I knew nothing about it. So yeah, I just thought it was cool to work at a brewery and clean up after this guy. So I did that for a while. And then he didn't have any more work for me after like Oktoberfest. And I was like, okay, he gave me like a month notice, which was really nice. And then randomly my brother who lives in Park City, Utah, calls me and he's like, I don't know what you got going on this winter, but if you want to move out here, um, he was working at a bar. Uh, we can use some bartenders. I was like, I had nothing going on. I literally needed a job. So I packed my car up and, and moved to Park City for the winter. And at that time, he, he, my brother, um, was working with this guy that was starting a distillery in Park City called High West. And springtime comes around. I do not move back to California. I wanted to stay in Utah for a little while longer. I thought it was a pretty cool place. And then that summer, the distillery started uh, in a warehouse down in Salt Lake. And my brother got me a job in the packaging. And it was horrible. Um, and there's just me and this other guy. <laughs> and we were just bottling whiskey and hand labeling whiskey and handwriting numbers on the whiskey bottles and shrink wrapping. And it was like this horrible process that took forever and it sucked. And I did that for a while, but this company's so new, they, they hadn't even started distilling anything on their own. They, they were blending stuff they bought back east. And that was the stuff we were packaging and shipping out. But I knew, like, as soon as their still gets up, like, their head distiller, when you're the head of something, you really don't do any of the hard work, the, the labor-intensive work. I knew he wasn't going to be doing any of the work, and there was only one guy in front of me. So I stuck it out for, like, a year doing the packaging. And then uh, that was 2009, yeah, 2010, I started uh, learning how to distill on a 1,000-liter still up in Park City. And we made whiskey mostly and vodka a little bit. And all that stuff, I took some of it on my own liberty. Um, <laughs> and then from there, I, I wanted to learn how to make more beer or make beer. So, because I was homebrewing at the time, learning how to homebrew, uh, I just started applying to breweries and I randomly got a job in Fullerton, California for this brewery called Bootleggers. It's like, okay, it's close to Santa Ana. I know people there. So I move out there and I'm there for a year. And then this guy that actually helped me get into homebrewing who worked at a brew pub in Park City calls me. He's like, hey, so-and-so's leaving. You, you know, you want a job? I was like, huh. And just thought about it. And I was like, okay, this could be cool. So I moved back. It was like one, literally one year later, I moved back to Utah and Brought my then girlfriend, now wife, with me and uh, started working for this brewery. And I worked at the brew pub up in Park City for a bit. And then they moved me to the production facility in Salt Lake um, too long ago. I forget. Mm. But yeah, it's been brewing beer. That's dope. <laughs> I, I think that's like a lot of adults' dream job to brew the beer. It, you know, and swim in it. It's not as exciting as you think. <laughs> it can be. Uh, I so I work at a production facility. It's pretty big, and I absolutely hate it right now. Um, I I would like to work at a smaller brewery if I can, and I may have that opportunity here in the next couple months because I'm moving again. Um, so we'll see what happens. You're moving, but you just finished your basement. It looks beautiful. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, like Talk about man cave. And... That's like a literal. <laughs> That's just a cave. Hey, That's like so a... I'm, yeah. I'm like five years on my best day and I barely fit down here. Like I'll hit the, the, the air duct really easily. So but yeah, brewing beer is all right. It's fun. But it's, it's what I love about it is the creativity when you're homebrewing. And I've been homebrewing a lot the last two years, year and a half, um, and made some pretty fun beers that I've really enjoyed. The beers we make at work, they're mass produced. They're still good, because I think the one thing we really do well 
uh, is our quality control and to make sure we make really good beer at work. And I've learned a lot there, but it's just production is just, it can suck. And there's no creativity. Like I'm never, I never get to be involved in like the process of designing a beer when you're, when you're designing a beer, it's like being a chef. It's, you know, you're playing with uh, natural ingredients that have to, you know, melt together and, you know, have a distinct flavor. So it, it can go horribly wrong sometimes, but a lot of times it goes right. You should start your own brewery. I, you know, it's so expensive. I'm sure and, it is. Yeah, I'm sure it is. But you sound like you would enjoy it. And I've learned over my years, I'm, I'm not a businessman. And to start a business, you need to be a businessman. <laughs> Makes uh, sense. <laughs> there was somebody that wanted to run the business. Okay. You just be the chef. <laughs> yeah. The beer chef. We'll see. But I might. So I'm moving to Ventura, California in two months. My wife just got a job there. Uh, we just found this out Tuesday. Hmm. And there's a f- friend that she knows that has a brewery in uh, Thousand Oaks a small one and they need help. So it's a good chance I'll end up there. We'll nice. see. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I, it'll be sad to leave Utah, uh, but it'll be exciting to be back there. Nice. That's like what, your third time moving to California or something? At least. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm used to this by now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, People are like, oh, what, what's, what, what's your favorite? Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, what's, what, what's your fa- what's your favorite beer to make? You like lager, sour? My, no, IPA? my favorite beer to make. I make a brown ale, which I call the Clevelander. Uh, that's my favorite beer um, to make and drink. More nice. importantly, I guess. <laughs> what's one of my favorite styles? Hey, do what but you I love, love what you do, right? Me, uh, <laughs> what's that? I said, do what you love, love what you do. You know exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I do a, a jalapeno lager that I, that's really good in the summer. And then I just made a, a basil, like a sweet basil beer recently that wow. I was pleasantly surprised with for the first time making it. So it's build, building my, it's like building tricks. I'm just building my, my brew book. I never heard of a basil nice. beer. That's crazy. Yeah. Hmm. Does, that, you put in beer. does that go, does that go well with pizza? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's dope. Um, in a little bit, we're going to open it up for questions. But if you're watching live, please hit the like button. And wanted to shout out our sponsor, Blank by Rollerblade. Shout out Blank by Rollerblade. Um, so, Mike, it's it sounds like a heck of a journey that you've been on from someone who started skating in 91 with some friends around the college campus did you think that skating would be in your life this long? It, it, it seems like it's just taken you up and it's been a part of your life for what? It's 30 years 30 now. Years. 30 years, which also means it's my 30 year high school reunion. <laughs> <laughs> a little scary. Um, no, I, I mean, obviously back in the day, it was such a whirlwind and so awesome. And the experience is so great. You, you think you'll skate forever but you don't, you don't know. Um, I'm just happy that I can still skate, um, at the low level that I can. <laughs> it's still fun though. Like, um, being out in California last week for the, for the wedding and getting a skate with John and Randy and like the, the Tuesday morning crew. Um, it was so fun. Like, I don't, I don't get that much up here. They, Utah has a Thursday night blade that I never go to because usually my wife's working on Thursdays and I have to be home with my kid. Um, but there's a huge skate scene here and periodically I get to skate with some guys, but I'm just happy I could still roll around and, and still be involved at, at some, some way. So what is it that after 30 years makes you want to put skates on your feet? Because a lot of people, leave it after a while and move on to other things and stuff like that. But 30 years is a long ass time to be doing anything, let alone to be playing yeah. on some rollerblades, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, Cause well, one, I think I'm, I'm just a kid at heart. Like I don't ever want to grow up I'm trying not to. Uh, it's still fun. Like I still have fun. My knee is freaking killing me right now <laughs> from last week, but 
uh, it'll go away. It'll be fine. And then I'll skate again. So I, I just still enjoy it. And that's as long as I can still enjoy it and still roll around, I'll, I'll still do it. Amen. That's like most of us too. Hopefully. Right. As long as our knees hold out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you took a spill yeah, a while back too. Yeah. Like you, you, you said oh, that you were going through some injuries, even like in the nineties, you said you were always hurt, you know? And I remember you, yeah. you fell on your face a few years back, right? Was that that was my worst injury. That was, it was before I was married. So how long have I been married? So it was like six years ago. Um, Hopefully your wife's not watching. So, no, she's not. We forgot all about this. She was texting me. Um, uh, my Indians lost too. Um, anyway, uh, so the BFL, which is the Blading Football League, uh, fantasy football league started by John Julio. There's 12 of us in it. And we try to get together for the Super Bowl every year. And one year we went to Vegas. And if anyone knows me, I hate Vegas, but I went. <laughs> and so Tori and I drive down to Vegas and AJ was there. Farmer always shows up. I don't know why he's not even in the league. Um, <laughs> but it's great. Uh, um, obviously, John was there. Me, Tori, John. Oh, Reyna? Was Reyna there? Yeah, Reyna was there because he was filming things. And anyway, we go to some park in Vegas. Forget the name of it. And they have a clamshell. And I love skating those clamshell things. So doing my thing, skating around. And it's kind of, it's my, I guess, my switch way to carve. But it didn't, like, I was doing it all day. And I went up and I, all of a sudden I remember I hit the top. And then I remember looking down and seeing the floor drain. And that's all I remember. And then I kind of come to and I'm, you know, knocked out. And I got out of the bowl with a little bit of help, like skated to the car. And apparently I was like going in and out of consciousness because I kept asking where we were. <laughs> and they kept saying we're in Vegas. And I said, why are we in Vegas? I fucking hate Vegas. <laughs> and I, I kept repeating that. Um, and then I remember feeling my teeth and I knocked out these three teeth. Oh. Um, I was like, shit, I knocked out my teeth. I've never done that. We go to the hospital and they say, oh, yeah, you got a concussion. Obviously, your teeth. And they took x-rays. I was like, oh, my arm hurts. <clears throat> they didn't say anything about my arm. So kind of ruined the, the Super Bowl for us. <laughs> it, was, it was right before the Super Bowl started. Anyway, go back, get back to Salt Lake. And I go right back to work. I'm like not missing a day of work. And my arm's just fucking killing me. And uh, I end up going to my doctor and he takes another x-ray and there's a huge crack in my arm and I'm carrying around, like at work, I carry around like sulfuric acid and caustic and like, I was like carrying all these chemicals around with a broken arm. And so anyway, I had to get it. Luckily it was like near the radius, but it wasn't so bad where they had to do surgery. And I think I broke it with my face cause I had my arm down and I, I landed on my arm. But yeah, that was, uh, that was a good time. <laughs> hey, I remember seeing that and that was like a serious injury. I was like, oh shit. And yeah. Yeah. You, you don't yeah. seem like you were skating that at that like level of extreme shit to have a fall like that, I, you know? I wasn't doing anything that exciting. <laughs> I was just going around a clamshell and I, I took a wrong angle. <laughs> so, wow. but I did, I did go back there and do it again. Next last time I was in Vegas. So. Good. That's good. I had to like go right back and do it. So, yeah, that's. I mean, I I've, I've torn my ACL. My wrists are screwed. If I have one bad fall, my wrists my they're done. My knees have given me issues. My ankles just stop working at times. Like, I've got my injuries like everyone else that skates. Mm -hmm. But that that was probably my worst fall, easily. I guess all things considered, that's yeah, not that the worst one thing. seemed rough. Yeah. Yeah. But I like, as far as I know, I didn't have a traumatic brain injury. So I'm all right. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's skating's dangerous. So, it is. you know, you got to pay to play sometimes. Right? And, uh, 
Yeah. Got to pay the piper, but be safe out there. Yes. Wear a helmet. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you want to open up for questions, Billy? Should we... Yeah. Um, if you if, do, you, un, unless you have anything, uh, unless you have anything else, Austin. I had something, but someone super chatted about it, so I'll, I'll give it to the super chatter. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so let's go through the uh, super chats. By the way, uh, for those of you who don't know, half of our super chats go to our guests. So anything that you put through, we will send half to our guest. Hopefully, we can get Mike a couple of beers, something like that. Yeah. There we go. And um, yeah. And um, yeah, that's it. So ask questions if you have them. Yeah. Um, Austin, go ahead. Yeah. First super chat from Alex Paz, who says, thank you for, uh, this is more to us, I guess. Thank you for an amazing video to watch the truth too. I just recently bought a copy on eBay. Thanks, Alex. I think that was, uh, from earlier in the episode. Uh, Boradori says, I learned from you in the hoax too, not to eat citrus in the morning after a night of drinking. (laughs) Yeah. Don't do that. There's valuable life lessons in there. It failed me twice. Once in high school, when I went to visit my brother in college, I I got drunk like twice in high school. Once was visiting my brother at college at Ohio State. And the next day, my parents weren't, like we all went and we went to church the next day. And before church, I had some applesauce. And we're standing in church and I'm just sweating. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I got to go. I just run to the church bathroom and vomit everywhere. <laughs> and then the next time on the hoax two tour. <laughs> so take take was it, it orange night. juice? What's that? Was it orange juice in the morning? Uh, it was an apple. Okay. And maybe some orange juice, but I was eating an apple, I remember. And I, yeah. Didn't, yeah. Didn't go on so well. Sorry, my wife just turned on the air. I was about to say that it sounded like the air just turned on. <laughs> Got like yeah. a blast. She's probably come home and is like, oh, it's so hot in here. Yeah, but she works like 13 hour days. So. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give it to her. Um, yeah. Orange yeah. juice is a nemesis, though, after a night of drinking. Do not drink orange juice after a night of drinking. Just throwing yes. that out there. <laughs> we, we had a. I had a bunch of the guys stay at my my parents' house in the basement back in the day. And I remember we were all like drunk, hungover. And Jeff Howard was like, I had like apple juice or something like that for everybody. <laughs> and Jeff Howard was like, no, do not drink apple juice after drinking. Do not drink it. I'm like, all right, Jeff, what do you want to drink? He's like, you know what? Give me some apple juice. <laughs> and then he won a contest later that day. So. All right. So well, to each his own. Yeah. Not everybody's yeah. human, you know, I guess. Uh, we have a super chat from Sean Michelson who... Uh, this is kind of what I wanted to talk about also. He says, uh, you you did have the first pro wheel and rollerblading history. Um, yes. Chris, I always yeah. mentioned this on our podcast um, that you were the first person to have a first pro wheel. Um, how, how, how was that? Did that come about? And like you out of all people, like how did all that happen? Um, well, Arlo, Scott Bentley, and myself were being the first wheels from Senate. And mine came off first. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I got, got a little lucky, so, but that's how it was. Like, I don't know why, but mine were, were the first ones done, and that's it. Was it the one with the uh, American flag on it? Yes. Was it these? Yeah, the American Dreams. Yeah. Wow, wow. look at those. Be like Mike. <laughs> and even on the back of that package, it has my... Uh, childhood address what why because i had to write something on the back and i put 13623 fox hills drive novelty ohio <laughs> 44017 like, i don't know i don't live there anymore <laughs> I, I found a, a picture of the uh, back of the box too but you it wasn't like legible you couldn't really read it in the picture that i found so yeah I, it's I in a weird font yeah yeah so i just put the front but i, I didn't realize that your address was on it <laughs> So congrats, Mike, on having the first pro wheel in rollerblading history. Thanks. That's pretty cool to have. Do you yeah, still have a pack of those good. fresh? Yeah, my mom's got a pack somewhere. I don't nice. think I do. But I know she does. For sure. Nice. Good gems so to I've have. I've got a couple lying around in a box. Mm-hmm. Unpackaged. Oh, we have another super chat from Boradori who says... When was the first time you saw a Shifty Royale and a Unity? 
Do you know who invented the name? By the way, Rip Tom Servo, Candy Machine God. Poor Tom. <laughs> Poor Tom. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, as far as the Royale goes, Brooke, I, I want to say, named it. And we were all just kind of trying it. I don't remember the first one I saw. But we were all just sort of trying them around 95. Um, it was the other question like first time I saw Unity? Uh, Unity, yeah. I don't remember that either. The uh, Shifty Royale. Yeah, I have no idea. And fun fact, I've never, never tried a Unity. I've never done one. <laughs> You've never done a Unity? No, never even. I don't even think I've ever even tried one. Whoa. But well, good. something what, I should what, do. What if the, what if Warpod asked, uh, "Hey, Coach, can you can you show me a Unity? What would you have said?" Or Caesar? What, what then? <laughs> Sorry, kids, not this time. Well, now, now I would have, now I would have uh, gone to YouTube and found a clip of someone that can do one. <laughs> <laughs> Tag somebody else. But in. back then, I would have yeah. just screwed. <laughs> That's what a good coach does. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, in in Hoax Two, uh, Dave Kolesh did a Shifty Royale, and he kind of like it looks like one of the first ones. Oh yeah. Do you remember that yeah. one at all? Like that long yeah. rail, and he lands and he's like Shifty Royale. That's a hard one. Or Shifty. Yeah, might I called. don't remember that. I don't know if I was there for that or not. But I do. I remember that. I yeah, in o- Omaha, I believe. Yeah. Interesting. I want, but I want we're the, all just, I think we're all trying one. So it was like the new thing, it's the new rage. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if uh, that was the actual first one documented. Probably was. It could have been. Yeah. It might have been. That was a good question. So. Uh, mm. ESG super chatted us. Thanks, to ESG. Eric Garcia. Uh, not a question, but more of a statement. <laughs> Hands down, Mike has the best stale grabs. Oh, that's true. That is true. Thank Hands you. down. You always did since back in the day. Yes, I tried. It's my bread and butter, I call it. That's a fact. That is a fact. The that stale Japans. Yep. You did a crazy one. You, Damn. I wish I had a. Did you invent that? No. Who invented that? Okay. Edwards was doing them. Um, when I, okay. I honestly, I want to say the first airborne audition, I saw Edwards doing them there. And I was like, whoa, it was like mind blowing. And, that's and, and to be clear, you, you were in Airborne, right? Uh-oh, you broke up. You were in Airborne, right? Just to be clear. Yes. Airborne, yeah. Batman and Robin, Double, Double Dragon, Batman and Robin. Brink. Yeah. Damn, man movies. Yo, can I get Double to Dragon? <laughs> yeah, it was for like a split second, you can see me. Yeah, like a half a day of filming, I was in it. <laughs> Dang, there's some skating in Double Dragon? Yeah, it's like a really quick and you could barely see it. It was filmed in Cleveland after Airborne. Yeah. Hmm. So, wait, just to be clear, I think on the street scene, the downhill street scene, were you doubling for the guy that had like the red helmet and like the green sweatshirt? No. I. So, I initially got a cassette. Is Jack? Oh no, we're losing him. Mike, coach, you hear him, Billy, or no? No, <laughs> no, we lost coach. I wonder if the AC fucked up his internet. He's st- he's still on. He's still on the line. Coach, <laughs> coach, I need to know how to do Unity, please. Coach. I mean, he's still in there. We didn't lose him yet fully. I hear something in the distance. Coach, if you hear us. Um, it, it's, it's, it's scary because his background looks like a, like a Saw movie. So who knows what's really going on. <laughs> At least it's freezed on like a, a decent shot of him. A good shot. It's a good yeah. shot. It's not like a. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, we were well, waiting for. It's Coach. been a nice podcast. It's been a good podcast. So <laughs> I, I did want to hear more about the the movies, though. But um, yeah, what he was in Brink, Airborne, Double Dragon, 
and what was the other one? Um, Batman, Batman and Robin. Robin. Yeah, I knew he was yeah. in Batman and Robin. I didn't know he was in. Uh, I didn't know he was in Brink or uh, Double Dragon. I never even knew they were skating in that either. Victor Victor Calendar was in Batman and Robin. There was a, there was a few. I think Ray Mendez was in Batman and Robin. Ray might be in the there show. Maybe a, a clarifier. Uh, Zeke was in Batman and Robin too. Zeke yeah. Boy. Um. We have a super chat so, in the meantime from Chris Medina. Thank you, Chris Medina. No question, just a a super chat. Thank you so much, Chris. Chris, you won. Oh Congrats, yeah, that's buddy. That's right, Chris. I don't know if you were here before in the beginning of the show, but you won our hundred. Uh, hundred episode giveaway. You you got a five hundred dollar gift card to Intuition Skate Shop coming your way, buddy. It's coming your way, buddy. It's coming your way, buddy. <laughs> Yo, where's Coach at? I don't know. Uh, you want to text him real quick and see what's going on? Yeah, I could shoot Cause, him a text because he's still on, but he's uh, he's just stuck. So, um, but yeah, Chris, uh, if, if you're still there you got a 500 dollars gift card thank you everybody for entering um thank you for all the kind words like billy said in the beginning of the show there was a lot of cool cool uh comments and we're going to start highlighting some of the comments from our past episodes too so anybody who's watching this not live uh feel free to drop some words of love in the the comment section below and maybe we'll shout you out in the next episode yeah um that is so cool that he's had been in so many movies though. That's like really and like traveling like with the judging and being a coach. Wow, you don't really think of those opportunities when you think about uh, our culture. You know, it seems like he was in a really good position at a really good time to do some cool stuff. Yeah, and he, not even like just general skate tour stuff. You know, it's it different things, judging and, and teaching and stuff like that, which is cool too. Mm -hmm. Definitely a different way. Should we all try to like uh, not move in solidarity with Mike right now? Anyone take a screenshot of that best meme went to Jump Street t-shirt? <laughs> oh no, we lost Mike all together now. Well, I asked him to sign out and sign back in, so maybe he's gonna pop back in. Um, so if he comes back in, just let him in. Yeah, he's in here. Let's see. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, Coach. We got him. We did it. Sorry. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Um, so, look, so you were just going on about like uh, being in all those movies. And yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know where I left off. So, yeah, I was. Uh, it was an Airborne, Dumb Dragon, Batman, and Robin, which was awesome and the worst Batman movie ever. <laughs> then Brink. But it's funny to. Like I meet a lot of people or work with people that are like, you were in Brink and it was like such a thing for them. I mean, there was even a joke on Saturday Night Live recently about Brink. So really, what was the joke? They, I want to see it was during like uh, the news segment. Someone did a thing. I don't remember. Um, they just did a thing on Brink. Like they mentioned Brink somehow. I forget exactly. Um, but it was like, to be on SNL to mention that. Mm -hmm. I think it was such a big part of like kids growing up in the nineties uh, or young, young kids in the nineties. Like, that yeah. was the Disney movie. So which was yeah. your favorite movie to work on? To work on airborne, uh, just cause skating at that time was endless and meeting new people, um, uh, the whole experience and it, you know, got me to California eventually. Yeah. Like opening the doors to meeting all these people and connections in the industry and stuff like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and just skating at the time was so raw. Everyone was just inventing everything. So it was, uh, it was pretty exciting. It was an exciting time and being in a movie was pretty cool too. <laughs> Yeah, and, and working For with sure. Chris Edwards, seeing him skate in person like that it must have been like a complete yeah. eye-opener. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, he, no one could touch him back then. Do you remember your first impression of, of Chris? Like seeing him skate and everything? Uh, I think I was just like, wow. You know, he, he's, um, he skates big. And he, like, that's what he does. And he's very intense. He's an intense, intense person. Like some of these stunts that we were doing, that everyone was doing, were pretty 
uh, they, you can get hurt. Like, so I don't know if you heard earlier. I was um, when I was explaining, I switched to that other character, and he went longer in the movie, and I got to slide under the semi. Like that first take of that, um, Chris was the lead guy in it, and he's like, "Okay, this is what's going to happen." <laughs> like telling us everything. He's like, "Now, if I just, if I." basically stand up and wave my arms and yell abort and just break apart. That means something went wrong. So sure enough, first take, like they cued the semi late. So he just like throws his hands up abort, abort. And we all just kind of break off. And this guy behind me just jumps on his knee pads and goes sliding through the intersection while a semi is going through the intersection. Wow. And it literally stopped on his skate on the boot of his skate. And like the whole production crew freaked out. But Chris is like, you know, a super intense guy when he's working and doing all that stuff and just skating in general. Like you can see the stunts he did on that movie were like that that gap into the dump truck is insane. Like I don't know how many how many people would do that now. So You talking about that last one into like the flatbed or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, we talked about yeah. that on his show and that that was yeah. insane to watch. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't there when they filmed it, but just like I saw the setup of it like days before, I was like, "Holy shit!" Like, someone's yeah. gonna do that. That's intense. Yeah, especially back then too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Were you the Were you the one that was doing the vert doubles with him? No, that was Jimmy Trimble. Jimmy Trimble. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well. Let's get into some of these questions, unless we have any more super chats. Do we have any more super chats? Uh, we have one more super chat from Stephen Penninger. No question, just a super chat. Thanks, Stephen. We appreciate the support. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we got some questions here, um, and I, I think we'll just take a couple, two or three. And after this, if you don't mind, if you got the time, I know you have a baby, but we thought it'd be cool to look at the just uh, a couple sections from Hoax 2 and maybe go through some memories, if, if you wouldn't mind. That'd be cool. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So we're oh hell yeah, sick. We're gonna we're gonna do that afterwards. It's gonna be exclusive for our Patreon members only. So if you're not a Patreon, uh, please come on. It's three dollars a month, and it helps us uh, be able to bucks. do cool things in the future. Yeah. So starting at three bucks. Yep. Um. So we have a question from Densenzi, or if that's how you say it, Densenz. Uh, Jump Street podcast. Please ask Mike which was the hardest trick he learned. Or took the longest time to learn? It's a good question. Uh, you know, I want to say a McTwist on a vert ramp. That's a serious one. And I ended up doing a like a rocket version. Just That's just how it came out for me. Um, and I, I remember in Dallas, I was doing vert shows. Myself, Arlo Brooke. Eddie Campos, R.I.P. Um, Dennis McCoy, he's the BMXer, and Tony Hawk. We were all doing six flag shows. This is before uh, Tony made his, his money, obviously. Um, and I was trying them there, like during like during the show, I I like throw one, and I ended up um, falling pretty bad and hitting my head. And I still like my neck is killing me right now because of that fall. But when I finally landed that trick, it was so for me. And not, I'm not—I wouldn't consider myself like a huge vert skater, but I do enjoy vert. I liked it back in the day a bunch. It was just very uh, fulfilling and satisfying. Damn, uh, that sounds like one of the most fun tricks to do. Yeah, <laughs> it looks Until like one of those fun tricks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Until you don't. Yeah, it's like it's like anything, like any handrail, it whatever you do, whatever, then you think you got it, and you don't, and it hurts. McTwists are so deceiving because it looks so natural when people do them on vert, because it's just like you kind of just go with the flow of like the the ramp, you know, and you just yeah. land forward again. Like it looks so easy, but it's definitely not. Yeah, but all you know, ramps are a little different as well. So you, depending on how the ramp is and how it throws you, and I'm sure they're much better now. Not that I don't really, I don't remember the last time I skated a vert ramp. It's, it's it's a very real experience, that's for sure. It's every time. Yes. It's not mm -hmm. chill. Yeah. Um. 
I actually wanted to, before we get into uh, Miguel's question here, I, I I wanted to ask you, what was it like uh, skating on Senate with like, you know, Dennis McCoy and I think, uh, was it Rooftop, the other guy, and also with Tony Hawk back in the day, how, how was the vibes like between the uh, other communities and the, the individuals? Dennis was really cool. Dave Mira was also um, sponsored. He was really cool. I think he stayed at my house once. Um, I saw Dennis a couple of years ago in China, and he's like, you're from Cleveland. <laughs> and he <laughs> forgot my name, but he remembered me, which I thought was nice enough. Um, like, they were really cool. Rooftop was kind of a dick, um, mm. but whatever. Like, BMXers back then weren't making money yet, so they were they were happy to make money. Um, so, the, like, I didn't have a big problem with BMX was being on Senate. I knew they were just trying to, you know, broaden their business, I guess. Try to be cool. And, it, you know, if anything, it like, oh, Rick Thorne, I think, was sponsored too. And he was always kind of like, he'd always give us crap. But I think he just did it to, maybe he didn't like rollerblading, but I thought he just did it to be cool around his friends. Um, but it was, you know, it was fine until they gave them all BMX shirts and they never gave me a shirt. But that's another story. <laughs> they, they gave all the BMXers, Senate gave the BMXers like pro shirts, you mean? So Yeah, so there's a, a 97 catalog, maybe. The cover, I'm on the cover and I, I didn't have a shirt on. Like everyone had like a pro shirt and everyone was like wearing each other's pro shirt and I wouldn't wear anyone's shirt. So I'm on, like, I had a mohawk and I just was in my shorts and I took my shirt off the shirt that I was on. Dang, you were the so, only rider who didn't have a shirt. Yeah. It's like, oh, cool. Thanks, guys. It's like, you, we gave uh, you the first wheel. We don't got to give you a shirt now. <laughs> yeah. Damn. It's wrong. It's wrong. We got to get my man Mike a I shirt. Said, I say it's wrong. Um, Miguel Ramos. Shout out Miguel. Has a question. What does Mike think of where skating is nowadays? Uh, I, I think it's pretty rad. Um, so luckily with the internet and like Instagram, you can see people skating all the time. And I don't get to go skating much. And there's really good skaters here in Salt Lake. Uh, but it's, it's so cool. You could be strolling through your feed and just come across some someone in China or wherever somewhere in Europe and just see what they're doing and like like it's pretty awesome what, what people are doing these days and it seems to not be so uh, not so many hammers so much but more like style and creativity I think are more of a um, focus and it looks great there's a lot of a lot of skaters that have been skating forever, like I still see like Sven Vokers like killing him. Oh yeah. Um, but then like just these newer skaters coming out of everywhere and they're, they're doing, it's, it's really fun to watch. And uh, it, also it's depressing because <laughs> I watch these clips and then I like, get these grand ideas. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go like to the park and I'm going to do this and then I get to the park and I'm like, that's not happening. <laughs> I got to work. I got this. I got that. Uh -huh. uh, but everyone, like, there's a lot of people that make it look really good and a little too easy. Uh, and it's not. <laughs> but I think skating's great. Like, every, like, there's still a worldwide scene. There's still people everywhere skating, and more and more people are getting back into it. So I think it's a good, slow uh, growth right now which I think is great for the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree. I'm sorry. Something in the chat came out. We, we do have a super chat, but I'm going to get to that in a second. Homer and Bart show says, are you guys on PCP? Isn't Mike responsible for nine, seven, six, Mike, are you responsible for nine, seven, six? I never knew who was. I'm not. So <laughs> nine, seven, six was Vera's company. Vera was, married to Mark Heineken at the time, they've 
gotten divorced. Um, I don't know when, but she, um, I don't know if she had a design background or whatever, but that was her shtick. She, she came up with 976 and she ran 976 and designed all the stuff. We had some, I don't know. I think like B came up with the small fish eating the big fish thing mm. shirt. Um, but she, that was all her. I, I did not come up with that. So to answer, we are um, not on PCP. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, guys, we did it. <laughs> We, didn't do the we have a we have a super chat from 17 bks um best story from ollie short slash dunkel rossi's era did were you the coach and um coach were you the team manager during that time i was um okay. so my favorite ollie story we're in uh korea south korea and i'd love traveling it's but like i my favorite thing about skating was being able to travel. And I was fortunate to travel to a lot of foreign places. So we go to South Korea and I think that was my first time going. So all I want to do is eat Korean food and we're somewhere. And, and you know, our, our person that's with us like, Hey, let's get some lunch. And what do you want to eat? And Ollie's like, there's a Domino's pizza over there. And I'm like, mm -hmm. are you kidding me? <laughs> if you want to eat Domino's right now? I got so mad at him. We ended up eating at the stupid Domino's. I was so angry at him. Because uh, I didn't get my Korean food that afternoon. And then I once punched Uncle in the face. But not out of anger, because he asked for it. <laughs> and I was happy to oblige. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so me and my friends used to punch each other in the face growing up for fun. We'd like be walking down the hall in junior high. And, like you turn a corner, your friend would just give you a little slap in the face. And that was a thing. And then I told this story to Brian Smith once. And now well, we haven't done a long time, but we used to get drunk and punch each other in the face, like real bad. And so the story was going about, about Brian and I punch each other in the face. And Dunkel was like, we were, I think, I don't know if we we're on tour or if we we're in San Francisco or what, but He's like, dude, I'll let you punch me in the face. I'm like, okay, can I do it right now? And he's like, sure. And I, I got him and he wasn't expecting it. Like I got him pretty good. Like not, not to like tee off on the guy. But yeah. Cool. John. It's like a good clean John, shot. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> not like so, a like, little uh, friendly interaction, like a good punch to the face, you know? Exactly. What a bunch hey. of tough guys. Hey, hey. <laughs> bunch of tough guys. Hey. Um, all right, so we'll take one more question. I know you, uh, you know, you have fatherly duties. We've been take, we've had you for quite some time. So we're gonna take one more question before we go into our Patreon and uh, check out this uh, hoax two stories and go through a couple sections. But Chris Medina says, "How was it being the coach on the Eric Burke profile on VG Five? It was dope to see them clips last week." with a capital them i forgot i see that. what you did there chris very very clever hmm. that was a fun trip and i kind of like i remember dave was like i'm gonna go to reno and i was like can i go he's like sure <laughs> so um yeah we just went and like it's obviously mostly about eric and eric's eric is awesome such a great guy and if you haven't seen his artwork on Instagram. It's amazing. Um, but that little trip was fun. It was like a weekend in Reno. We skated some ditches and he showed us around Reno and just had a good old time from a VG5. Wow. A long time ago. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of the show, when Billy was like, we were introducing you and Billy was like, oh, Mike was in the first video I ever saw hoax too. And I was like, I was going to say the same thing about me too, because my first video was hoax five. I'm like, oh, I don't remember him in Hoax 5, but I forgot that you were in the Eric Burke section at least. Yeah. Well, VG5. VG5, yeah, VG5, my bad. Yeah. VG5. Supernatural, yep. Supernatural. Mm -hmm. hey, Supernatural. Before uh, we get into the other thing, um, I just need to say James St. Hours is a dick. So <laughs> he wanted me to say that. So I had to, I had to give him a shout out. Can I second that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 
Some Ohio, some some Ohio boy banter. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know we're going to end it. I just wanted to mention one more question from this last uh, last viewer that we have here from Same Boat who yeah. says, hello from Thailand. We'd love to hear oh. more about his time here. Did he skate any of the islands? Any other crazy memories come to mind? Apologies if I miss more tuned in at the drug test. So what do I do not skate any islands. We did go to Koh Samui. Is that where we went? I forget. Um, we went to a couple islands in like beach towns just to kind of like stop training for a weekend and relax. Um, there were some crazy times. Uh, I met the prime minister once Whoa. who later got kicked out of Thailand like with a, like a, a coup, like an army coup happened. Whoa. Yeah, I tried to speak Thai to him, and he had no idea what I was saying. I was trying to <laughs> say, like, nice to meet you, and it didn't go so well. Luckily, no, it was right there, and he jumped in for me. <laughs> uh, one time, it was me, Note, uh, Eric, the skateboard coach, and one skateboarder, and we were we were training up in Soup and Burry, and we – we went to Bangkok for the weekend, so we headed off just to hang out. <laughs> we couldn't find a hotel. We walk into this hotel. It's like the only like one we could find that had rooms, but it was like a lover's hotel. <laughs> and so there's these two older white Americans with these two younger Thai boys. It's like we were just laughing. We had to get the rooms because we had nowhere else to stay, but it was a total like hookup hotel. Like you park your car and they like, put a sheet around it and then you enter the room through the garage. Like it was so weird. And they had like the rooms itself were like, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> what the hell? But, yeah. Weird stuff like that. Other cultures. Man. Probably other... Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a hell of a story, hell of a life. And you know, it was really nice to uh, catch up with you last weekend and to see you still involved and, that you're moving out to California. So um, I'm sure we'll see more of you around and potentially some more skating clips if the body's holding up. But um, we'll do you have any shout outs or last things you want to say? Um, words of advice, words of wisdom for the skating community? You know, um, for everyone still involved, like, I love what you all are doing, what, like, love what John's doing, love what Heiser's doing. Rollerblade. Um, everyone's so involved. They're dedicated to it, which is awesome. And all the people coming back to it, welcome back. Good to have you again. And it's just fun going to the park, seeing people skate and hanging out and having a good time. That's what it's all about, having a good yeah. time. As long as we're all smiling and having fun, this, this skate is still all over the world. We're, we're not going anywhere. At the end of the day... It's all awesome. It's all love. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Mike. Please hang on because we're going to go through a couple of parts of Hoax 2. It's not going to take too much of your time, 10 to 15 minutes. Nice. And um, Nice. And everyone, thanks for joining us. If you're watching, please hit the like button. Please share, subscribe, comment, do all the things. Shout out to our sponsor, Blank by Rollerblade. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And stay tuned for our next episode of 102. And congrats to our winner, Chris Medina, with big contest. So thanks, everyone. We'll see you on the next episode, everyone. Peace. Peace.